Right, so welcome back to all of those joining us on the airwaves, on radio, on digital platforms. For those that tune into the Crossfire podcast on Spotify, thank you so much for all your support. For those that check me out on YouTube, the Cyber Hitchhiker, uh, you can go check me out there, Facebook and Instagram as well. But we are going through a series that I've entitled uh, Let's Talk Church, and this is part two in the series. And we left off with the bit of church history last time, and you can go back to the Crossfire podcast to catch that episode if you want to. We're trying to keep these short, no longer than 20 minutes long each. But we are coming to part two where I left off and I was about to start discussing where do church buildings come from? And I just want to have a sip of coffee. No podcast can be complete without coffee and the mugs from our guys at Our Daily Bread. Really awesome sized mugs. So where did church buildings come from? Um, There's one thing that I'm certain the Apostle Peter and the early disciples never said, grab the kids, honey, we're going to church. I'm pretty sure that that is definitely not something that they said. Um, Why? They never said this because to the early disciples, you did not go to church. The early Christians used to first meet in synagogues until they were actually kicked out of the synagogues. And during this time, they also met in homes. And eventually, these homes... And catacombs, uh, where the dead were buried, like the tomb of Jesus, would be the only meeting place for them. Because like I discussed in part one, up until around 300 AD, uh, the church was an underground movement and it wasn't a recognized religion or as illegal to practice your faith as a Christian if you were part of the early church, at least the first 10, 10 generations after Christ. Now... For the first couple of centuries to go to church, and I say this in adverted commas, would have been unheard of. Church was not a noun like it is today when we go to church. If you look up church in the dictionary, it'll probably tell you it's a church building. Um, it was maybe a verb, maybe an adjective, maybe it was an adverb. I mean, I'm not really that good at English, but it was definitely a doing living thing. It was definitely not a building. But what I do know from checking this out, is that church, the word used to describe church back then, which was ecclesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, actually meant gathering of believers. It was when believers came together, it was a group of people. No matter where you were meeting, you were the church. There was no such thing as a building. Like right now, I'm doing this podcast from inside the studio, which is housed inside the Mission House slash church building. Um, Obviously, things have changed since back then. But when? And when and where did church buildings actually come from? And one school of thought that is represented by a author, well-known author, she has published numerous books on church history. Um, She would probably be called a modern-day missionary today. Uh, currently residing in the USA. Her name is Felicity Dale. And she says this in one of her books, uh, quoted from The Army of Ordinary People. The first time history indicates that believers met in buildings is in AD 321, when Emperor Constantine adopted Christianity, but followed the pagan tradition by building special temples for the Christians. So he adopted Christianity as a general religion, and it was legal to be a Christian, and then he built temples because of him being a pagan, a person who believes in multiple gods, it's not a slur. He paid for special temples for the Christians to be built. And that is where we developed this paid professional clergy class that arose, which is the paid priesthood. There are many, especially those who advocate for a very, and and this is where people get very divided. Um, There are those who advocate for a very simple, small house church movement. um, And they love to vilify the birth of church buildings. They are completely against buildings because buildings are wrong. They are basically... uh, full of, uh, it's, it's just, it's not meant to be that way because too much money is spent in the building. We glorify the building. The building becomes the center of the attention. I don't, I don't fully believe it, it, it. That is the right way to look at it. But is it really that simple? Well, actually, it is most likely that buildings used exclusively for Christian worship actually began to crop up before Constantine was building these temples. 
And the oldest known church building is called the Durer Europus. As Gonzalez, who was an early writer in those days, explains, as congregations grew, some houses were exclusively devoted to, to divine worship. Thus, the oldest Christian church found in the excavations of the Dura Ropus and built before, uh, before AD 256 uh, seems to have been a private dwelling, which goes with what Acts says about how the richer members in the church would give up their houses because they had their nice houses to have meetings for the church in these houses. And then they were eventually created and transformed into buildings that were used then exclusively for worship and not just by people living there. There is, however, some credence to what Felicity Dale is saying. Church buildings were totally different from what they were in the century prior to what Constantine did. And Gonzalez points out the churches built in the time of Constantine and his successors contrasted drastically with the simplicity of churches, such as those of the Dura Europus, and this was written around uh, 126 AD. So, to answer the original questions, elaborate and decorated church buildings came from the time of Constantine, these lavishly furnished temples that he built. Functional church buildings came from a time prior to that, perhaps even a century before Constantine started building these. Now, let's have a look at and this is very important for me because I think this is something that the modern day church has really, really lost. And that is five features that made the early church uh, very, very unique. And these are what these five features are. In the first three centuries, Christians were persecuted more than any other religious group because they refused to honor other gods or worship the emperor. They were seen as too exclusive, too narrow, and a threat to the social order. So why? If Christians were seen as so offensive and were excluded from circles of influence and business and often put to death, like I've been discussing, why on earth then did anyone become a Christian? Uh, Larry Hurtado explains this question in two books that he wrote. He wrote the book called Why on Earth Did Anyone Become a Christian in the First Three Centuries? And then Destroyer of the Gods, Early Christian Distinctiveness in the Roman World. And one main reason uh, he explains in one of his books was that the Christian church was a unique social project. They were a contrast community, a counterculture even, not trying to be like the world, but actually going in the opposite direction. They were a counterculture that was both offensive to some, obviously, but yet very attractive to many. But what made the Christian community so different? Now, we're not used to this kind of thing today, and I think in some certain parts of the world it is still like this, but it offered a new identity. Well, you might say, well, Vaughan, what do you mean by new identity? And Hurtado points out that the basis of this unusual social project of the time was the unique religious identity of Christians. And here's the thing, and I mean, this makes complete sense, but we don't think about these kinds of things. We don't look at these things in context. Before Christianity... There was no distinct religious identity. Uh, since your religion was simple, an aspect of your ethnic or national identity, wherever you lived or came from, you grew up in a certain uh, religious faith. If you were from this city or from this tribe or from this nation, you worshipped the gods of that city, tribe or people. Uh, your religion was basically assigned to you. You were born into that religion of whatever was commonly used as worship in your area. Christianity brought into human thought for the very first time the concept that you choose your religion, regardless of your race or your class. Christianity also radically asserted that your faith in Christ became your new and deepest identity, while at the same time not officiating or wiping out your race, class and gender, because that's who you were underneath your Christianity. Your Christianity was just used to supersede that. Instead, your relationship to Christ demoted them to second place. This meant that to the shock of Roman society, 
because they were very uh, sort of hierarchical, if I can put it that way. All Christians, whether you came from slavery, were you whether you were free, or whether you were high born into the upper middle classes, or whatever the race and nationality, you are now equal in Christ. And we can find this in the Bible in Galatians 3, 26 to 29. You guys can go and look it up. This was a radical challenge to the entrenched social structure and divisions of Roman society. With, like I said, they were very hierarchical. And from it flowed at least five very unique features. And this is so awesome because this is the true church. The early church was multiracial and experienced a unique unity across ethnic boundaries that was startling for those from the outside to see. See the description of the leadership of the Church of Antioch as an example in Acts 13. Throughout the book of Acts, we can see a remarkable unity between people of different races. Ephesians 2 is a testimony to the importance of racial reconciliation as a fruit of the gospel amongst Christians. Number two, the early church was a community of forgiveness and reconciliation. As we have said, Christians were often excluded and criticized, but they were also actively persecuted, imprisoned, attacked, and killed. Nevertheless, Christians taught forgiveness and withheld retaliation against their opponents, which was the example that our Lord set during his uh, crucifixion. He did not once talk back to them while they were mocking him and putting him through that bogus trial that they put him through. He kept quiet and just let things happen. So they withheld retaliation against opponents. In a shame and honor culture in which vengeance was expected, the Roman culture, this was unheard of. Christians didn't ridicule or taunt their opponents, let alone repay them with violence. They repaid them probably with forgiveness. Number three, the early church was famous for its hospitality to the poor and the suffering. Where do we see churches being famous for this now? Uh, not many. While it was expected, obviously, in the communities to care for the poor of one's family or tribe, Christians promiscuously helped, which means abundantly overboard went out of their way to help giving to all the poor, even of other races and religions. Note this, other races and religions as taught in Jesus' parable, which we all know so well but forget about, the Good Samaritan found in Luke 10, 25 to 37. It was unprecedented in those days. You can read an essay from Gary Fernegren that's called The, Incarn the Incarnation and Early Christian Philanthropy. Um, during the urban plagues, Christians characteristically didn't flee the cities during these plagues, but stayed and cared for the sick and the dying of all groups, often at the cost of their own lives. This is what craziness. Number four, it was a community committed to the sanctity of life, and they were fervently committed. It wasn't simply that Christians opposed abortion. Abortion was dangerous and relatively rare in those times. A more common practice, and doesn't this ring a bell for a lot of things that happen in South Africa at the moment where we have this kind of thing happening now in the modern day and age? Because abortion was dangerous and relatively rare, a more common practice was called infant exposure. Unwanted babies were literally just thrown onto the garbage heaps to either die or be taken by traders and go straight into slavery from birth and then into prostitution. Christians used to save these infants from those garbage piles and took them in through adoption. I get emotional because I'm an adopted child. I wasn't wanted. And if it wasn't for my mom taking me in, uh, who knows what, it would, what would have happened to me. So that is the most true to its form sanctity of life that I could ever see is how the early church used to basically get these babies and take them from the garbage piles that were just tossed aside because they weren't wanted, left to die, excruciating death through starvation. Come on now. It was also, and this is my fifth point, it was a sexual counterculture. Roman culture insisted that married women 
of social status would abstain from sex outside of their marriage, so they would only have sex with their husbands. But it was expected, guys. This is back in the day. Roman culture was thick into this. It was expected that the man, even if you were married, would have sex with people in lower statuses than you on the ladder. You would have sex with slaves, prostitutes, and even children. This wasn't only allowed, it was regarded as unavoidable. It was a common practice. This was in part because sex in that culture was always considered an expression of one's social status. Sex was mainly seen as a mere physical appetite that was irresistible. Christians' sexual norms were completely different, of course. The church used to forbid, and still does, according to our law in the Bible, any sex outside of heterosexual marriage. But the older, seemingly more liberated pagan sexual practices even eventually gave way to stricter Christian norms, since the deeper logic of Christian sexuality was so different. It saw sex not just as an appetite, but as a way to give oneself wholly to another, and in so doing, imitate and connect to God who gave himself in Christ. It also was more egalitarian to treat all people as equal and rejecting the double standards of gender and social status. Finally, Christianity saw sexual self-control as an exercise of human freedom, a testimony that we aren't merely pawns of our desires or fate. And this is taken from Shame to Sin, the Christian transformation of sexual morality in the late antiquities. Loving Challenge. It was because the early church didn't fit in with all of the surrounding culture, but it rather challenged it in love. It was a loving challenge. That Christianity eventually had such an effect on it and actually started changing the culture around it, even if not everyone became Christian, but their practices became more Christian than pagan. This could essentially be the same kind of social product, uh, social project that could have a similar effect if we were this devoted in modern day times. Imagine having this kind of a project now as a church and actually living like this. What guidance can we find uh, in the New Testament for the use of buildings for a church? Uh, not much. The idea of a building in a church for worship had not come into its own yet. We saw home parties, synagogues, where, which were Jewing, Jewish teaching centers, uh, mountain sides were used, the Jewish temple was used, the lake shores were utilized for ministry for Jesus and the local church. And then in one of my favorite spaces mentioned in the Bible is in Acts 19, 8 to 10, and it discusses the hall of Tyrannus. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, boldly in the synagogue, arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Verse 9. But when some became hardened and were not believed, slandering the, slandering the way, with a capital W, because that was Christianity was called, the way, in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them, taking the disciples and conducted discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all of the residents, now listen to this, in two years of doing church in the lecture hall, this is what happened. So that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, had heard the word of the Lord. All residents. Guys, that's a lot of evangelism. We don't know a lot about this lecture hall, but what we do know can give us some principles of thinking biblically about buildings. Number one, it was a public place. Churches should be located in familiar, visible locations. And this hall was evidently in the city center in a well-known place for both believers and unbelievers. It was a place for disciples to gather, number two. Paul took the disciples from the synagogue where they were unwelcomed to this hall, where he could train them further in evangelism and life on mission as a Christian. It was a place for gathering disciples. Number three, it was a place to interact with unbelievers. This is something that has crept out of the church. Non-believers were actually invited in and comfortable with the space. They didn't feel intimidated. Excuse me. They didn't feel intimidated. Discussions were held that no doubt served to evangelize the lost and at the same time equip those that were saved. It was a place for disciples to be sent out. All of Asia, like I read in the passages, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. 
I mean, craziness. That was serious multiplication. Where do you see churches doing this and growing like this today? Who was spreading this word? And guys, come now. I'm busy doing a podcast. And this was done without radios, without live streaming, without social media. Yet we've got all these modern day tools to spread the word. And what are we doing with it? No doubt those who were being equipped and trained by Paul and others in that hall were going out and doing amazing things, but were in the center of where unbelievers were gathering. The Hall of Tyrannus was a building that made possible the exponential multiplication of disciples. And that should be the goal of every church and the hope of every church building project or meeting place. So what challenges does our current gathering spaces offer for the multiplication of disciples? I mean, number one and three are the most likely challenges, which is uh, it was a place to interact with unbelievers and it was a public place. So how can we make our church buildings more of a public space that is useful for the whole community? Here's a few ideas for those that want to know. And these are not difficult, but they just are a change of the way we operate as a church building, not a church people. Start a daycare at your church. Uh, Have a Mother's Day art program for mothers in your local community and in your local areas. Starting a coffee shop or a diner, not an exclusive coffee shop after church on a Sunday for your believers to sit and have coffee. No, a Monday to Saturday coffee shop for guys to come in and sit and have coffee whether you are a believer or not, as in a normal coffee shop. And A, I'd go one step further and offer free coffee. Who's not going <laughs> to, come on now, who's not going to come in for free coffee uh, at a coffee shop that doesn't ask you for money? Maybe just have a donation box. How awesome would that be? Opening up the building for after school programs. How many communities are in need of after school programs in a safe space? Come on. Um, holding public forums, not just Christian discussions, but actual public forums, training events for the community. And then why not, instead of building a church building, move into a public space like a gym or a movie theater or a school of worship, a school for worship, you know? I mean, how can you make your church building a place to interact with today's unbelievers? Stained glass and steeples are not the answer anymore. Uh, They used to be for people experiencing life, but we know that we want to reach those that are not experiencing life. We should think through our service times and styles. I mean, uh, this is something that only caught me recently. Later service times are easier for young and unchurched families to attend than early morning services. Offer discussion forums for people with questions about life and God. Open the floor up, get people to come in and have these discussions, not debates, discussions. Start a compassion ministry that deals with real-life issues for unchurched people in your communities, like addiction, teen pregnancy, poverty, divorce care, grief care, and I can go on and on and on, but you get the idea. So I'll leave you with uh, three questions as we end off on part two of Let's Talk Church. What ideas do you have for making church buildings more effective in multiplying disciples? Let me know in the comments. Uh, Send them in. Uh, Let us know. Has the modern church lost the essence of what it actually means to be a follower of the way, like we heard in Acts? And has our focus shifted maybe from people to buildings? Ecclesia, remember, the church was a verb, a doing word of people, a gathering of people, not a building. So has our focus shifted from people to buildings? And the buildings, which are not actually the church. I'll leave you guys hanging there until we come back for part three. This is Vaughn, a.k.a. the Cyber Hitchhiker. For all those that have tuned into radio, thank you for listening. And for all those that are catching us on the digital platforms, we'll catch you on Spotify, we'll catch you on YouTube, and we'll catch you on every other platform that we're on. Google us, look us up, and we'll see you in that digital space. This is Vaughn saying goodbye and God bless.